Good morning. It's Monday, the 6th of November, and this is Govind Raj Ethri Raj based in Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day risk premiums on crude oil are receding sharply a month after Hamas's attack on Israel. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi sets a poverty benchmark by providing 800 million poor Indians free food grain. Air pollution cripples Delhi, the capital of India, even as responses are too feeble and too late. India Inc. needs to get more active in communities and its business plans in climate change efforts. And the pitch report, lessons for the core report audience from the World Cup series so far with Ayaz Bemin. This is a core report with Govindraj Ethiraj. Oil turns steady, focus on demand. A month has passed since Hamas attacked Israel, and despite Israel's retaliation, ground attack, and continued tensions in the Middle East, the risk premium on oil is disappearing. The focus is back to demand and the sluggishness of it. With the war yet to spill over to the crucial oil-producing areas of the Middle East almost a month since it started, concerns about crude demand are now resurfacing, reports Bloomberg. U.S. oil stockpiles rose in the most recent week of data and factory activity in China, the biggest crude importer, moved back into contraction last month and low liquidity has also exacerbated U.S. oil's steep price swings, added Bloomberg. So Brent crude is just around $85 a barrel now. In general and specific, obviously this is good news for countries like India, where high oil prices can cause economic havoc. Speaking of oil and the transportation of it, there is considerable action in the cargo and shipping industry, which of course reflects the health of global trade. Last month, the Wall Street Journal reported that daily market prices to move cargo from Asia to the United States and Europe in September were down as much as 90% from early 2022, a bad sign for ship operators since voyages are often unprofitable at current rates. The largest container carriers, which move some 95% of manufactured goods, apparently responded by cancelling sailings en masse this year, mainly on the route from ports in China to the US West Coast, according to data from shipping platform Zeneta, quoted by the Wall Street Journal. And more recently, last week, shipping and logistics giant AP Moller Maersk said it would cut more than 10,000 jobs. The Wall Street Journal attributes this to the ending of a pandemic-fueled cargo boom, leaving the industry with a surplus of ships and sharply lower freight rates. Freight rates, by the way, have fallen 58% year-on-year in the third quarter and are down 90% from their peak during the pandemic. Maersk, a bellwether for global trade, saw its third quarter profit plummet to $520 million from about $8.8 billion last year. India's own exports have declined by 2.6% to $34 billion in September this year against $35.3 billion in the same month last year. During April to September this year, exports contracted by about 9% to $211 billion. Imports are falling too. Interestingly and not surprisingly, venture capital firms that once provided supply chain technology startups in the United States are pulling back as companies themselves run out of runway. Digital freight startup Conway stopped operations in October just 18 months after it was valued at $3.8 billion, said the Wall Street Journal. Others have laid off workers. Back to the markets and in India, equity markets rallied for the second straight day on Friday on hopes, among others, that interest rates would not rise further in the United States and money would return to stocks from bonds. The BAC Sensex surged 283 points to end at 64,364 levels. The Nifty 50 was down 92 points at 19,226. This is all on Friday. Foreign portfolio investors, however, continue to sell, pulling out about 3,400 crore in just the first three trading sessions of November. Now, this came after investors withdrew about 24,000 crores in October, about 15,000 crores in September, according to data from depositories. Before this outflow, foreign portfolio investors were buying Indian equities incessantly, the word that's being used quite often, in the last six months from March to August, and bought in almost 174,000 crores. So for this period, they are a net positive still. Now, all the selling is obviously putting some downward pressure on the market, which obviously has been seeing strong domestic flows. Who is poor? The extent of poverty in India has been an interesting debate since it usually tends to turn political very quickly and perhaps not surprisingly. 
Economists I speak to often point to analysis put out by Dr. Surjit Bhalla, now India's man and executive director at the IMF, and his analysis which points to poverty at somewhere close to 1 to 2% of the population. Other estimates are a little higher. None of the economists in question wish to wrestle with Dr. Bhalla on his numbers either for the pointlessness of it all or the robustness of his argument. Be that as it may, it is safe to say that the Prime Minister himself has set a benchmark number by announcing the extension of the Prime Minister's Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana or PMGKAY, which provides free food grains to over 80 crore poor people for the next five years now. Now, five years obviously means beyond the general elections that will take place in uh, April 2024. The scheme will cost about 200,000 crores annually to the taxpayer and also extends the same scheme which would have otherwise expired this year end. The discussion on that figure, that's 200,000 crores, is a separate one and we'll perhaps pick it up in a few days. The word Garib obviously means poor. Dr. Bala aligned economists may jump on me and say that is a wrong interpretation of the term or too literal. Given that qualified economists are wary of taking on Dr. Bala on his numbers, I cannot obviously even hold a candle on this issue. Nevertheless, 800 million of 1.4 billion is more than 50% of the population and is being termed as poor. Actually, it is almost 57% of the population, way beyond even the worst-case estimates touted by all the economic naysayers and the skeptics. However, and to me, that's not the key issue. First, we must acknowledge, as most economists, including the critics are, that the economy, that is India's economy, is in relatively good shape. All the numbers we refer to here on the core report, as they come out, including goods and services tax collection and income tax collections, all reflect that there is buoyancy and we are headed in the right direction in good speed. The key issue is that there is another half of the economy, quite literally, which is getting left behind. One recent indicator of this is rural employment, which climbed to about 11% in October from 6.2% in September, while the urban rate eased slightly to about 8.4%, according to data from the private Centre for Monitoring Indian Economy. Now, to the government's credit, they are responding to the real problem, which is hunger and poverty, through a series of measures, apart from the scheme that we've just spoken of, to, of course, various other measures to, for example, ban the export of non-basmati rice, export of wheat, and export of sugar, and among other measures to manage prices in food, cereals, and vegetables. Now, obviously, most people do not want to get into a bare-knuckle street fight, as Dr. Bhalla is wont to do, albeit only on the estimates of poverty numbers. The government has to address the food needs of those who are getting left behind in this economic growth, one economist told me. The other and good thing the government is doing is the One Nation, One Ration Card platform, where anyone can get their due entitlement of 5 kilograms of food grain anywhere in the country. Now, this particularly helps hundreds of millions of migrant workers whose plight, of course, among other times, came to fore during the COVID pandemic itself when many had to leave for their hometowns suddenly. So the Prime Minister's Garib Kalyan An Yojana, launched during the COVID-19 pandemic for a three-month period, was subsequently extended. It was in addition to other subsidized food grain offerings. And last year, all schemes were merged offering the subsidized food grain for free. Air pollution gets worse. The dense thick smog that has enveloped cities like Delhi and Mumbai refuses to dissipate, as local authorities are waking up too late with actions and responses that are too little. Delhi has shut primary schools till November 10th, effectively transferring the problem of managing pollution in the public space to the private space, as often is the case. I was in Delhi for the last three days and testify that the air quality is shockingly poor. You can feel the acridness in your breath and staying out for too long without a mask means you will most likely develop some chest congestion or nasal blockage as I did. Lots of people are wearing masks so the awareness is thankfully high and in the opposite of COVID-19, people wear masks outside and take them off when they enter a closed space like a home, office or shop. Meanwhile, while there are no shortage of websites or tracking tables for air quality, I found one called iqair.com. A Swiss air quality technology company, which obviously hopes to and profits from all of this. And they put out an interesting live ranking of most polluted cities in the world. Delhi, no surprises for guessing, leads the table right now at about 317. Mumbai is a little down the table at 158. And Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata are actually in the top six. Delhi is followed by Lahore, by the way. On the same table, I found that Switzerland or one city in Switzerland called Bern had an AQI of 12. 
it never ceases to amaze me. Those who find solutions to problems actually don't really face them themselves. For example, the iPhone of air purifiers in India is perhaps the Dyson, along with some well-known Japanese brands, of course. Dyson is English, they started as a vacuum cleaner company and are obviously extending their technology. Not because of a severe air pollution in Wiltshire, southwest England where the company started and its current headquarters in Singapore where it relocated a few years ago. Blue Air, another well-known air purifier brand on the more premium end is Swedish originally and now owned by Unilever. Coming back to Delhi, the impact of air pollution on work and productivity cannot be understated. Now, this is not something that we can live or work with, whether business or even politics. It demands the same scale of response as a COVID-19 crisis, which cities like Mumbai, since I live here and I saw, did quite well to respond to. Is business ready for climate change? 2023 is going to be the hottest year on record. Floods have hit Libya, India, Greece and China, while Brazil is seeing one of the worst droughts. Canada and Hawaii have seen raging wildfires. All these, says Arunaba Ghosh, CEO of the Council for Energy, Environment and Water or CEEW, in a recent article in the Hindustan Times, have left government insurers and companies struggling to find a response. Just in the first half of 2023, natural catastrophes cost losses of about $120 billion, of which only $50 billion was insured, he says. For businesses, since we have focused more on them here at the Core Report, the priority now has to be adopting and adapting to this new world in a much more proactive way. Businesses cannot simply hope for the best. They should instead prepare for the worst using a calibrated approach via three broad strategies which include focusing on local communities, their lives and livelihoods where businesses have their operations, says Dr. Ghosh. This, he adds, is not corporate social responsibility but strategic corporate responsibility. Elsewhere, firms like Amazon last week said that they have now installed more than 1.1 gigawatt or 1,100 megawatt of renewable energy capacity across India. Amazon said it added a new 198 megawatt wind farm in Osmanabad, Maharashtra, bringing the company to about 50 wind and solar projects across the country. To put this in context, a city like Mumbai at peak consumes around 4,100 megawatts of power. I caught up with Dr. Arunaba Ghosh and I began by asking him how businesses were now responding to climate change in general and specific. I think there has been a three-step change over the last few years. The first was in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed and India submitted its nationally determined contributions. There was a sense that, okay, now India is making some commitments about mitigation of emissions. And that did result in this thinking within the energy sector, particularly the power sector, that we've got to get serious about how we build out our renewable energy and so forth. But that is one part of Indian business. But the good thing there is the bulk of our renewable energy capacity has been built by the private sector. So this, in a way, it was not just a new industry that got created, but it was an industry that got created by the private sector, which was not historically the case with you know older energy sources. The second shift happened in 2021, exactly two years ago. The 1st of November 2021 is when Prime Minister Modi in Glasgow announced the Panchamrit, as well as the net zero commitment as part of it for India to get to net zero by 2070. Now that then woke up the broader set of Indian industry that this was, as I've argued before, not just an energy transition, but a call for an economic transformation. What is happening now, I would say, the third shift, which we are sort of underway in our sort of business consciousness, is internalizing that in addition to the opportunity, there's also a real risk that we are facing in terms of extreme weather and how that extreme weather not just impacts, you know, small, you know, the huts of small farmers somewhere, but how it can disrupt business operations, how drought can disrupt water availability for industry how a flood can disrupt uh, operations in a tech center like Bangalore and you know prevent people from getting to work or how construction industry you know which is a big employer of people in emerging markets can severely get impacted when you have heat stress and lower productivity of the labor so internalizing that this is now happening is a reason why some businesses at least are trying to ask themselves where do I make those investments? How do I make sure they are 
protected, that they are protected against these risks that are emerging and rising over time. Right. And what's the manifestation of this in terms of response? Obviously, some people would do more than the others, but how are you viewing it? You know, it can manifest in two different ways. One is that if you see some clear opportunity for a new business line, you know, if you're an energy company, then you want to invest in renewables. But if you're not an energy company, you think that there is an area of work that you can get into, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's electric mobility, whether it's green hydrogen. We're seeing to an extent a great deal of private sector interest in engaging with these emerging business opportunities. To give an example, we see, for instance, that in renewables, a lot of investment is coming in from sovereign wealth funds, but also private equity and public equity. But in green hydrogen, we're seeing a lot of big conglomerates with large balance sheets committing to invest huge amounts of capital. But in electric mobility, it's interesting, where again, we are seeing exponential growth. Last year alone, we suddenly got over a million electric vehicles sold, most of them in the two-wheeler, three-wheeler category. We see a lot of venture funding coming into the electric mobility. That's one way to look at it. The other way that it's manifesting, Govin, is that some companies, particularly those that are in more vulnerable areas, say coastal areas that are vulnerable to storm surges and cyclones, are trying to now get a handle on what is the risk, physical climate risk exposure that their assets are going to face. But this is not something that has been widely internalized across Indian industry. And I think this over the coming years, this is something that they will have to wake up. Right. And, you know, between the second and the third shift that you pointed out, and it's quite interesting. So one is the opportunity and people have invested in renewable energy, looking at a report or a statement from Amazon in India saying that they've now invested more than one gigawatt in renewable energy capacity, which I'm sure has various reasons for it, but it's contributing to the solution. But taking care of one end of the problem, if so, but what are people doing, if at all, if they can rather, on the other end, which is, you know, where lives are getting affected and so on, and which may go beyond just say, just protecting my factory or ensuring that I create another disaster recovery center and so on. Just to use your Amazon example, I don't want to comment on that individual example, but the idea here is that companies are now going to be evaluated and eventually mandated to control and abate their scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one, that's coming directly from the company's activities. Scope two, from the indirect use of inputs such as the electricity that Amazon will have to purchase to run its data centers right, or its warehouses. So making sure that that electricity is clean is going to be the job of large corporations. But eventually, three will also come in how your products and services are used, the indirect emissions that emerge from it, from fuel-related activities, from transportation of your products, from waste generated in your operations, and so on and so forth. So increasingly, we will see, especially for companies that have uh, footprints across multiple jurisdictions, that in a way, earlier it used to be, you know, devolve into the lowest common denominator now you will have to align your activities to the highest environmental regulations that are emerging wherever you're operating. And then you will have to align all your work towards those highest standards. So if the EU is moving to a certain level of standards, then a company in India hoping to operate in EU, not just exporting to the EU, will have to start aligning there regardless of what the Indian standards are. But then the other thing, and I drew attention to this even in my column that you referred to, is that companies will also have some degree of responsibility of the broader area in which they're operating. And that's not just disaster relief. Because ultimately, your neighbor is coming from that area. Maybe your supply chains are in that area. Maybe your ancillary industries and inputs are coming from that area. So unless you are thinking about climate risk beyond the factory boundary, to see how disruptions anywhere along the supply chain can damage your business prospect, you will continue working on this issue as a below-the-bottom-line CSR activity. Once you internalize that supply chain disruptions, just like as we are experiencing for other geopolitical reasons, that 
climate induced supply chain disruptions are bad for business, it becomes an above the bottom line issue. And the sooner companies start doing that, it becomes prudent, just like you and I will go for an annual health checkup to ensure that we get the right insurance for ourselves. It's important that companies go through their annual health checkup and report that to the regulators, right? That this is my risk exposure. Now I need to protect myself. Arunaba, thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you, Govind. World Cup cricket enters the last rounds. It's been an exciting World Cup cricket series so far, not least for the surprises and upsets that we've all seen. One record that many will savour, of course, will be Virat Kohli equaling Sachin Tendulkar's record of 49 one-day international centuries when he hit a century in a match against South Africa at Eden Gardens in Kolkata on Sunday. Looking back, there are some interesting takeaways from the teams and their performance as well as the way spectators have returned to the stadium to watch even as live streaming hit new records all the time. I caught up with well-known cricket writer and commentator Ayaz Memon to get a sense or rather a temperature check on the last few weeks and what we at The Core Report could take away and of course a quick prognosis on the last few laps ahead. The World Cup started a, a little sluggishly, but it's picked up pace. We've had some really good upset results. We've had, you know, Afghanistan, which is turning out to be perhaps the story of the World Cup. We've had some close matches. And also, we've got crowds coming back into the ground, largely for India matches, but crowds swelling up. In the first couple of matches, it seemed like this might be a flop show where spectatorship is concerned, but that is not the case. So that's a happy sign. Because it's not just about this World Cup, it's also the future of one-day internationals or 50-over cricket that was important. So, all in all, I think all these are very good signs. Of course, the biggest plus point from an Indian point of view is that the Indian team is doing fabulously. Right. And you mentioned upsets. What are the surprises? Afghanistan beating England, defending champions England, and then, of course, also beating Pakistan, beating Sri Lanka. They're still in contention for a place in the semi-finals. Who would have thought? You know, along with Netherlands, they were the two minor teams, so to speak, Afghanistan and Netherlands. And every major team which came into this tournament would have in their calculations imagined that, okay, these are pakka points. We'll definitely get two points playing Afghanistan. But that's not happened. So that has kind of created turmoil for some teams, notably England, who've crashed out of the tournament. They're not in the running at all. And in fact, their situation is quite dire, Govind, because if you don't finish in the top eight, if you're number nine and ten on points, you don't automatically qualify for the Champions Trophy, which is going to be played in the future. So it could be a double whammy for England, unable to defend their title here. And not just that, but being out of the Champions Trophy too, if they don't win their remaining two matches. And any quick lesson from why England has not done well so far? Poor preparation, I think a little complacent thinking. You know, when you look at a tournament like this with 10 teams and you've got teams like Afghanistan and Netherlands, as I mentioned, most major teams thought these are four points for the taking. And then there's Bangladesh, which is struggling. Then there is Sri Lanka, which has also been injury yet and struggling. So you feel as a team coming into this tournament that if I get the better of two other teams out of six, who are the main, kind of the big guys, you know, I have a very good chance of being in the semifinals. But that has not happened because they lost, they lost to Afghanistan and they've just kind of suffered setbacks everywhere. Right, and these are good lessons for our audiences at the core report. I mean, whether you're playing cricket or something else. I think preparation is so important. The big lesson for me, the big takeaway is that you can't rest on your past laurels. You may be defending champions, but what you did was four years back and the world has changed since then. The way the ODI game is played has changed. You know, and there's years of Afghanistan poised to make it to the semis. We'll wait and see. Very tough for them. They have to beat Australia and South Africa or at least one of them and, you know, net run rate and hope other teams will beat each other but they're still in the running. So how are you looking ahead in the final two weeks? We're on the cusp of uh, the semi-finals now, the knockout stage. So India is already there. South Africa is there. Then there's Australia who won a match against England yesterday and they are on 10 points. So they should be virtually in there. And then there's a whole cluster of teams of, with eight points each, which is New Zealand who won four matches on the trot and then they've got stalled. Then there's Pakistan. Then there's Afghanistan. So any of these teams could conceivably make it into the semis and join or maybe even get past Australia. So there's a lot of drama waiting to happen. I think that the next few days should tell us, make the picture really clear. But right now, it's very intriguing and exciting. Right. And as you said, that the future of one day itself was at question in some ways. And you feel that this series, at least the way we've seen it so far, seems to suggest that its future 
is secured, which I'm assuming is good news for the organizers and those who are sponsoring it. I'm not sure whether it's totally secure. We'll have to wait and see, but it's not collapsed. You know, if suppose there'd be no crowds at all, no matches. I mean, if we didn't have exciting matches, one of the complaints in the first week was, where are the close matches? In T20, we got so used to seeing margins of victory being two runs or one wicket or tied scores and so on, going into the super over. There was none of that. But then the exciting matches came up. And of course, the marquee match was India versus Pakistan that had the attention of the entire cricketing world. While it was a one-sided match, it just got the excitement and the focus back onto the tournament. And since then, I still think a little more thought needs to be given as to how this ODI format can be tweaked to make it television-friendly and worth the while of people to spend eight hours watching at the ground or on television. That's really the challenge. Right, Ayaz. Thank you so much for joining me and hope to see you next week for a final countdown, as it were. Thank you. Take care. Speaking of cricket, Saudi Arabia has apparently offered to invest around $5 billion in the Indian Premier League or IPL if it were to be separated and created as a company from the rest of BCCI or the Board of Control for Cricket in India. Now, that would value it at around $30 billion, according to Bloomberg. This news comes on the heels of an offer from Abu Dhabi, capital of the Emirates, to invest up to $50 billion in various projects, nothing related to cricket as I could see, also according to Bloomberg. Mission Impossible triggers new standards for AI. US President Joe Biden signed an executive order last week on Monday establishing new standards and security measures for artificial intelligence. Deputy White House Chief of Staff Bruce Reed told the Associated Press that AI is an issue of great importance to the president who was impressed and alarmed after seeing fake AI images of himself and learning about the terrifying technology of voice cloning. According to Reed, Biden's concern about AI also grew after watching Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 at Camp David. Reed said that if the president hadn't already been concerned about what could go wrong with AI before that movie, he saw plenty more to worry about. In Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt fights a non-human villain, the sentient and dangerous AI known as the Entity. In the opening sequence of the film, the Entity hijacks and sinks a submarine, killing its entire crew, reports Variety magazine. According to AP, Biden was profoundly curious about the technology in the months of meetings that led up to the drafting of the order. The action items on the executive order will be carried out in the next three months to a year, with those pertaining to safety and security to be addressed first, according to the AP. The executive order, which the White House says, directs the most sweeping actions ever taken to protect Americans from the potential risks of AI systems, including developing standards, tools, and tests to ensure safety in AI systems and requiring AI developers to share their safety test results and other critical information with the U.S. government. We can, of course, expect to see similar actions or reactions in India as a debate towards some sort of protection also builds up at good speed. On that note, that's it from me. Have a safe, pollution-free, and good week ahead. This was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.